Thank you, Colin. Colin, what happened to the Eye of the Tiger music we, we talked about? Uh, I wasn't kidding. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Um, anyway, thank you for, for having us today. Um, pleasure to be here. My name is Adam Gala with Cross River Bank, also a member of the OLPI Board of Governors. Don't want to take too much time. I know we're running a little bit late. So without further ado, I want to welcome our panelists to the stage. Now, now Jeffrey, who's training for his first marathon, really should get out of the tiger. So. So let's get right into it. Um, we're going to try to make Madden, which could be a somewhat a dry topic, a little more interesting today. Um, in fact, we're not even, and we'll do something revolutionary today. If you look at our panelists to my left, not one of them represents a law firm, which I think is revolutionary from a Madden topic conversation. So we have lawyers on the panel, but not a law firm. So before we start introducing our panelists, I first want to take the opportunity to thank the organizers, of course. I also would, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize the efforts of Congressman McHenry and Meeks in their efforts towards Madden uh, reform. Um, and then I want to start by letting our panelists actually introduce themselves. So start with Jeffrey on my far left. Sure. Um, I am Jeffrey Myler, CEO and founder of Marlet Funding. Um, Marlet is a fintech platform that partners with Cross River Bank to deliver a simple, transparent, frictionless uh, solution for customers that want to uh, consolidate their debt. We execute, you've seen it on the uh, different slides, under the Best Egg brand with consumers. Uh, we are a three and a half year old business that is headquartered in Wilmington, Delaware. Hi, I'm Ram Alawalia, founder and CEO of Pure IQ. We're the leading provider of risk management analytics uh, for the category. So we work with the CROs and the CFOs to help them address their analytical questions, which might include stress testing, valuation, ensuring the assets match liabilities. Uh, we have a significant data from TransUni, which is one of our investors and key partners. Uh, and as a part of that, we're able to help investors and issuers develop a point of view on the risk. Uh, Phil showed in the presentation earlier the charts on the securitization trends, that kind of data, um, and the access on the securitization market is a core part of what we do. Um, I'm Alexandra Alex Karam. Um, I'm, I'm not the general counsel at a firm. I'm a product counsel. Yeah. I'm here in place of my boss, Manny Alvarez, who couldn't come. Um, I, uh, a firm is a uh, uh, online uh, lender. We also partner with Cross River. Um, we, we partner with merchants and provide a point of sale financing option um, for, for consumers um, to get installment loans um, where they can pay off uh, big purchases um, you know, with a simple closed-end installment loan. Good morning. My name is David Cotney, and um, uh, I served as a, a state regulator for 26 years in Massachusetts. Um, last six years, I served as commissioner of banks in Massachusetts. I left uh, state government uh, at the end of last year, and uh, doing several things now. Uh, one of which is I now serve on the board of directors at uh, Cross River Bank. Great. Thank you all for, for joining me. Um, all, all four of the panelists have a breadth of experience to share with us, and I think a uh, breadth of knowledge as well. So I want to start with David. Um, I recall when the case was first uh, you know, acknowledged by the market, the panic, with which everyone reacted to. And I can't help but think that um, you know, panic oftentimes is, is, is reactionary versus uh, you know, proactive. And, and David, from your point of view, um, when you first heard about the case and, and saw how the market reacted, as a former regulator, um, how did you take the case? So, a state regulator, um, it's, it's somewhat of our, our gut instinct. Uh, we hate uh, uh, federal preemption uh, as, a, as a rule uh, when it comes from uh, federal regulators. Um, and we tend to cheer when federal preemption gets uh, overturned. So, uh, as you can imagine, though, there's, uh, there was a uh, mixed reaction uh, among the states uh, uh, in, with the Madden decision. And I'm not talking about a mixed red state versus blue state reaction. I'm talking about just even myself personally, uh, there was uh, sort of this mixed reaction. Because when you, we, when you hear it on the surface, you say, oh, you know, this is, you know, it's a good thing that, you know, states' rights. But on the other hand, there is this, um, this notion among all state regulators of you know, the, the 
exportation of interest rates, uh, which started with national banks and was extended by Congress to, uh, to state uh, chartered banks uh, for competitive purposes. There is no state regulator who wants to undermine that, that underlying principle. So it, it's somewhat of, as I said, it was a, it was a very uh, mixed reaction. Uh, but you know, one of the other underlying issues is, is this notion of uncertainty uh, and the uncertainty that, that a, a decision like, uh, like Madden creates. I will say it didn't start with Madden. It's been around for a very, very long time. Oh, I remember having a heated uh, discussion with a, a partner at a, a large law firm. Um, this was about 16 years ago who was defending um, a, a debt collector that we licensed who had taken on debt from an out-of-state bank uh, that was made in excess of our state small loan act uh, 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 cap. And we said that that debt collector could not uh, collect on that debt. And she said, well, you're trying to extend your regulation to, to this, uh, this out-of-state bank. And I said, if the out-of-state bank wants to collect, they're, they're welcome to do so. I don't, I don't wish to regulate the out-of-state bank, but I have an obligation to that, to that debt collector who, whom I have issued a license to. So um, we did win that argument. Uh, they, they decided they would, we, they would not take, uh, take uh, any debt from this out-of-state bank. So I can tell you that it's not, it's not a recent un, uh, phenomenon. And there's, when, when there is this type of uncertainty that is out there, um, there, there, there are disruptions and problems on both sides, both on the industry side and, and on the regulator side. So then as, as a follow-up to that, David, um, as you know, a board member of a crossover bank and you understand how the bank's model works, um, has your view changed at all? Have you seen anything different that has uh, revised your opinion or your thoughts on the Madden case? Yeah, and, and, and certainly uh, I think this is where uh, industry could do a much better job because uh, and perhaps you know certainly where uh, where Olpe can be helpful is differentiating because in the minds of many, at, you know whether it's state AGs or state regulators or state cons or, or consumer groups out there, it's you know kind of everybody gets lumped together, and you know, so for example, there's been a lot of uh, fights on payday lending, loans of you know short-term loans of. 500, 800, 1,000 um, percent, and you know many states have, have cracked down on this, and uh, and have been very very successful at uh, at, at 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 these types of uh, rent a tribe uh, models or rent a bank models, and unfortunately some in in the eyes of some and of, of many. Uh, these models are all the same. And I think that what has been you know, an eye-opener for me is how very different each of these models are. And that's where I think both the industry needs, uh, needs to do a better job and where research can really help to, to differentiate between different types of models and these very, very extraordinarily high interest rate type uh, uh, models versus uh, some that may exceed uh, certain state usury limits, but are significantly lower, in fact, and, and in lower than, than most credit card rates. Absolutely agree, great point. Um, following up with that, that, that same concept, um, when the decision did come down, the entire market was affected, uh, others, some more than others. Ram, from your perspective in the capital markets, what did you see? Sure, so the, the reaction across all participants in the capital markets was ranging from between surprise to stunned, I'd say closer on the stunned side. Let me walk you through the roles and responsibilities of key actors in the markets and how they responded um, after the judicial event. Uh, so trustees, which play a, a critical role in distributing cash flows uh, in a securitization transaction, which as you saw from Phil's slides earlier, are an essential pillar to funding growth. Trustees, due to the lack of regulatory clarity as to whether these loans are valid or not, are unable to enforce their role to distribute cash flows according to the parties. The role of a trustee is, is to drive accountability and honesty in the system. And so many trustees have, have pulled back. They will not admit loans that are under District 2, Madden Midland, into the various trusts or SPVs that they administer. Um, second, you've had warehouse lenders. Uh, 
warehouse lenders are typically investment banks or large money center banks that finance the non-banks. So all this fintech innovation is coming from non-bank lenders that by definition do not have access to cheap liquidity and financing. Therefore, they partner with banks such as Cross River Bank or they secure a warehouse line um, from various institutional investors, money center banks. The warehouse lenders are not in the position of taking first loss credit risk. They are lending in a senior secured position and so when you have legal uncertainty around the validity of these loans, that means there's a non-zero probability that these loans could be deemed void, which would lead to an impairment and a reduction in principal balance. So if you're a bank, you don't want principal losses. You want to finance. Consequently, warehouse lenders have also pulled back uh, from financing District 2 Madden Midland loans. The third bucket are the asset managers and whole loan investors. So asset managers will provide the balance sheet, if you will, to non-bank lenders that are originating loans. Asset managers need a warehouse line uh, in order to achieve the return objectives. And without that, they're unable to do so. So when they purchase loans from a non-bank lender, they exclude those loans from their uh, loan purchasing agreements. Uh, and finally, you have the ratings agencies. So although we've seen dramatic growth in securitization, there's not been a top three ratings agency that's provided investment grade rating to a securitization of loans that includes Madden Midland collateral. Uh, and that means that the ability to market and distribute loans into the broader debt capital markets where there's abundance of liquidity and financing and where you have investors that are clamoring for yield to achieve their long-term liabilities and obligations are unable to do so. So the overall, the, the infrastructure and the roles and responsibilities and the ability for these parties to execute against um, their intended functions is impaired due to the lack of regulatory clarity. One could easily argue that the most acute impact was felt perhaps by the bank partners and the actual originators, the sourcers, the marketers of the loans, and, and those like Marlette Funding. Jeffrey, from your perspective, um, when the case for it was first decided, how did your business react? What was the first impulse? How did you handle it? What were the steps in dealing with the case, the results? A hey, good question. Um, from a standpoint of approaching this problem space, um, like we would approach any problem, we first get some legal analysis, see how that um, matches up with what we're doing from a business practice standpoint, create an action plan and then execute. Um, important in decisions like this are not just the business impacts, but the impacts to the customer. And uh, also important is kind of maintaining trust uh, from a market standpoint. The difficult thing that has been referenced many times this morning is how to navigate the uncertainty of this. So not all business decisions have this level of uncertainty. And the other part that is important in planning um, on how you're going to navigate this uh, regulatory challenge is getting a good understanding of what other players in the space are doing and what other th third parties are thinking about this issue. The last thing you want to do from a regulatory standpoint is find yourself taking an outlier position and not understanding that. You may still choose to take an outlier position, but you want to know that. <laughs> Absolutely. There's always that, that tension between acting too fast and not acting at all. So that's a great point. I want to take uh, just one second. I'd like to hold questions until the end if we can. So we'll leave about 10 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, Alex is here representing a firm who's another crossover client. I also want to mention she's, represent, she's in place of originally Manny Alvarez, who welcomed a child into this world about a few days ago. So congratulations to Manny. Um, Alex, the banks and, and their partners, um, the platforms, took many approaches to dealing with the Madden case. Some of them, such as curtailing lending in those states, Second Circuit states, sometimes reducing interest rates in those states, and other times creating structures to sort of differentiate the facts such as master service or subservice structures, other things that would perhaps separate on a fact basis the case of Madden versus the actual structure that the platforms use with their bank partners. So in your mind, not that one structure is what I'll call Madden proof or, or uh, foolproof, but in your mind, how does the decision process work in deciding to go one way or another, noting that each option has its drawbacks? Sure. Um, I think uh, what was, has been said is, is important that it's hard to address concerns from such a, an uncertain decision with kind of very, not very clear guidance on how this impacts our industry with that being 
um, specific to banks and, and debt collectors, um, or national banks and debt collectors. So it's, it's hard to address kind of the uncertainty of that. And I think what um, was said about seeing what other people in the, in the industry are doing, kind of getting, it seems like there's been a consensus on kind of steps that we can take to, to move forward that addresses some of the concerns um, without kind of going too far or becoming an outlier. So I think it's really been about um, seeing what kind of other industry players are doing, influenced a lot by what investors and, and um, secondary market um, transactions, kind of the risk tolerance there, and creating a set of differentiating facts and or structure that um, fits your business and kind of the risk tolerance of your business in particular. Sure, and each business and the business model is absolutely different. It was, I think Phil mentioned earlier, he saw a study on the impact in Madden in the Second Circuit States. Um, I read a, a study recently by four professors of the different graduate schools who together performed research to show there actually was an impact from the Madden case on lending in those states specifically. Um, Ram, back to you. Um, when you look at the actual data, because you could probably argue either way, because data can be manipulated one way or another, how would you assess the overall impact of Madden as it looks today? Sure, so we have a significant amount of data, both from TransUnion and also the fact that marketplace lending is really premised on transparency. And with the Madden Midland judicial event, you have something close to a natural controlled experiment. You can kind of imagine that event as suddenly turning on the state usury laws for New York, Connecticut, and Vermont, and seeing what the impact of lending interest rates are in that market versus um, the, the federal market. And so, Adam, to your point, there was a study uh, from a blue chip uh, set of uh, legal scholars from Columbia Law, Stanford Law, and Harvard Law, uh, which is, means probably up there with Newton's Law at this point in terms of credibility here. And so what they concluded was that there was, quote, unquote, clear evidence that, quote, a significant reduction in credit availability for riskier borrowers. And there's a, a study that's online. It's easy to find or reach out to us. I'm sure we can provide that. And they show additional evidence that the population that was most impacted was precisely that population that's a subprime borrower whose next best alternative is a, a high APR payday loan at 500% or more. Um, so the, the warehouse lenders, originators, have pulled out of those markets. Um, those borrowers are underserved. They've also found that there's, there are no loans from marketplace lenders with a, to any bar with a FICO score of 625 and below. So it's very definitive, strong evidence um, through this natural experiment that that lack of regulatory clarity has, has impaired uh, lending to those markets. Can you extrapolate from the Second Circuit data or the study that you just referred to uh, nationally? M meaning, could we take it one step further and, and suppose that there is an impact nationally, what would it be? Meaning, we see what happened in the Second Circuit. Do people then automatically extrapolate that and say we must adjust in other states as well in case it happens in other states? How do you see that? Well, that's a, you know, if that happened, if you, if you take all the state usury <coughs> caps around the United States and measure what percentage of loans originate above those state usury caps, and you say, well, if Matt and Midland were to go national, then it would mean that you would not have origination above those caps anymore then that would impact uh, a substantial portion of, of lending. Of course, the numbers can change with, with coupon rates and so forth, but um, you know, upwards of 50% of loans would not be able to be originated um, under that, the current financing framework. Um, and that would be um, really a, um, uh, a disappointment from a public policy perspective because the way to think about a marketplace lending installment loan is that you're offering a lower rate fixed rate, fixed term, transparent product to help a borrower consolidate out of higher interest rate credit card debt. So the, um, in part of the study I referenced, the average interest rate they found on these loans was about 17% as compared to what you typically see in the credit card debt for that risk population, which is around 30%. Um, and so the impact to borrowers that will be forced to have higher financing cost or no access to credit um, is, is really quite substantial in terms of the, the economic impact. I think we'll have to do some more math to, to tie that out. We have a fresh batch of TransUnion Day where we're analyzing that question. But overall, though, I would say upwards of 50% of the loan origination, the marketplace lending market, would be impacted if Madden Midland uh, were to go national, so to speak. 
Wow, those are uh, big numbers. So it sounds like from the panelists more broadly, um, the issue mostly is related to uncertainty. Right? You have the case decision, and then you have the uncertainty that comes from the case decision, which no one knows how to exactly deal with because they're all, everyone's guessing. So David, as a, as a former regulator, I would think that financial inclusion is something close to your heart. So here you have panelists telling us that a, a case, rightly or wrongly decided, has a tremendous impact both in the Second Circuit and potentially nationally. So as a regulator, you have to struggle with that, looking at the facts of the case, looking at the impact locally and nationally. How do you think about financial inclusion related to the imp impact of the Madden decision? So uh, I referred to the, uh, the issues of, of payday lending earlier. And um, there are some real life examples of, uh, of where uh, in North Carolina and New Hampshire in particular that sort of had this, I, I don't want to say unregulated, but you know, no cap uh, uh, small loan uh, uh, lending in the area of payday lending and then imposed a cap. So the, the, the payday lenders, both the storefront and the online, well not the online, they, they, they continue to exist even uh, although illegally. Um, so the, the Center for Responsible Lending showed that when those exorbitantly high interest rate loans went away, consumers turned to, al uh, to, to alternatives that were available. Uh, friends and family negotiating with their creditors, other, uh, other means. So the, the, from a financial inclusion uh, standpoint, although uh, some uh, argued that this was taking away an option, um, the, the, the concern that regulators and state AGs had or, and have about payday lending is not the access to short-term credit, it's the debt trap part of it, that somebody gets in because they, they have a temporary um, life event, but that temporary life event becomes years and years of snowballing debt. So most you know, regulators and AGs don't shed a tear when those options go away. But we do have real concern when real uh, access to credit uh, does disappear. And so we have had concern for years by some of the, the short-term small dollar uh, options at banks, which dried up uh, in response to some, some you know, actions by uh, federal regulators. Um, so so it, again, it's a differentiation between different types of credit. Um, the, 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 the types of credit that are going to help uh, low income or underserved consumers, we want to see more options available, uh, whether it's through new alter, alternative uh, credit uh, uh, data or, or other means, those are all good uh, options. What, what many want to see is that the, these exorbitant, you know, loan shark type options get put out of business. Sure. So the, to your point earlier, I, I think you could argue that it's an education issue, right? It's exactly so it's right. educating regulators and why this is different than what they're thinking it is, which is a payday loan. So Jeffrey, if you were sitting with David in a room and he was your regulator and, and you wanted to educate him on why you're different, why you're not a shark, because Jeffrey's a really nice guy. I mean, <laughs> he wouldn't harm a fly. So I'm looking at Jeffrey and saying, how would you explain to David why you're offering a product that consumers should have? Hey, that's a great question. I think the the thing that David said that's really helpful is this point around um, the use case of uh, the product. Uh, it does not perpetuate debt. And I think that what's really useful and you know, to his point, uh, income, it's really a, a burden for industry to make sure that they really differentiate what the product is. So um, you know, broadly from a debt consolidation standpoint, Circumstances for the consumer is as follows. On average, they're 46 years old, uh, 21 years on the bureau. They're carrying 15K uh, in credit card debt, typically at 21% APR. On average, just as was quoted, the industry offers a 17% interest rate, but that is not the only benefit. 
See, the problem space for these people is they've been too often tempted by the min-pay option on their credit card. And they need the structure that comes with a three- or five-year solution to pay this down and get themselves out of debt. And their personal circumstances are such that typically these people, they have liabilities that exceed their assets. And they're 46 years old, and they know they need to make a change. Now, what, what is great and empowering about this product is those consumers that pay off their debt, typically after six months, are rewarded not just from an interest standpoint, they typically move 25 points from a FICO standpoint. So this, this product can really put consumers on a path to financial health. And getting that message out is just so important. And we, we in fairness, have not done a good job. Yeah, and uh, OLPI, I think, can do a lot to help that as well. Um, you know, Jeffrey, you've done several transactions in the secondary market. I think uh, you'd probably be best to speak about that tension between Ram's point earlier, how the capital markets are really driving the volume and some of the changes that are being uh, effectuated because of the, the lower volume due to the Madden case. But how much of your business decision as to how to react to a Madden case and structure your, your business is affected by the secondary market? Um, or are there other things that you can do in the interim to create vehicles that are, don't require you to go to market because some investors are not either buying the loans or securitizing? How do you deal with that, um, knowing that the secondary market is sort of timid for those loans? Hey, that's a, a great question. To your point, um, to date, we have securitized about a billion dollars uh, in loans. And um, the experience to date is, uh, to your point, um, you really have to navigate this uh, Madden issue. Just as was said by uh, Ram, it, you know, you've got concerns from a warehouse perspective, you've got uh, concerns from the uh, securitization uh, underwriters, around liquidity, and it's just ironic in this yield-starved world that there, this is a product that people would love to get behind, mm -hmm. and the supply of liquidity is being restrained by uncertainty. So yes, um, I, I think the thing to your point is structurally, some people have prevailed and uh, you know, still are doing um, loans above the usury cap uh, in the Second Circuit uh, states, but uh, without, I think, in the medium term, some level of uh, relief, I think there's another shoe to fall as far as supply of credit. It will continue to be even more constrained if there isn't a solution that's for forthcoming, and sounds like there is, but. Absolutely. So, so Alex, you work for a point of sale platform, slightly different than Jeffrey's platform. How do you think about what a firm can do, what OLPI can do to help your business grow um, to alleviate some of the uh, tensions around things like the Madden case, assuming legislation is not imminent. What can you do? What can OLPI do to further that? Sure. I think um, with Edifirm, we've been really focused on engagement with the industry, with regulators, with um, getting out and, and really educating on what our products are, kind of how they benefit consumers, and really talking about how we're the concern with you know, over broad or kind of um, changes or legislation that could adversely impact this good access to credit that could otherwise be, um, uh, uh, that could be provided um, to consumers that are beneficial to consumers. So we've been, you know, talking to the extent anytime state regulators have round tables, um, you know, we've been lobbying um, by, with the Marketplace Lenders Association. We went to Albany to like to lobby on something that um, New York was potentially looking at that could affect our industry. And really, we found that folk, I found that focusing on, on the differentiating factors on what the good products like ours are, are bringing and how are they beneficial to consumers has, has really helped. Sure. I mean, David, you'll be happy to know I'm actually an firm client. I took a loan to buy a mattress. It was a fantastic, uh, very convenient method, and the uh, loan paid off successfully. Right, right, yeah. and and I think you know we we say that it's really uh, it's really good that a, a lot of our industry is is focused on on transparency, on um, you know telling consumers exactly what they'll owe up front. Um, that are they're good products for consumers. So great. So David, so OPI, you know, the summit's fantastic. Second year, um, I know a lot more planned down the road. Realistically, 
what can be done to ensure, I mean, collaboration between platforms and banks, um, secondary market participants, I think, is, is almost easy. What can be done? Is it really possible to allow state regulators, uh, other regulatory agencies to collaborate with these other groups? Oh, I mean, a absolutely. I mean, there's the, you know, the, the education that, that, that I mentioned. Um, the, nearly every, uh, you know, state uh, regulator is open to, uh, to ideas of uh, financial inclusion. Um, it's, you know, it, there is sort of the, when the rubber meets the, the road uh, aspect in terms of, of legislation. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, the, there's the Madden fix bills at the federal level. There's, you know, as you mentioned, Albany, there's going to be uh, issues at the state level. Uh, so I think yeah, it, it's going to be very important to uh, educate um, the, the regulators uh, and the, the members of state legislators, uh, le state legislatures, about you know the, these products, the differentiation between these products, and the impact that certain legis you know well-intended legislation can have to hamper the markets, to harm you know efforts in financial inclusion. So I think that there there's certainly opportunities for you know I don't I don't know whether I necessarily label it collaboration, but ways to uh, to, to, to educate and inform and help, uh, help uh, folks at, at the state level understand uh, these impacts. Sure. So the one thing I would say is that it seems like oftentimes education done in a reactive way is not as effective as education done in, in, a, in, a, in a proactive way. So Jeffrey, if you were doing this again, winding back to the beginning of the formation of Marlette um, and your partnership with Crossover Bank or even independently, how would you think about perhaps doing things differently? What might you do differently either with regulators, state regulators, federal regulators, to perhaps educate them in advance of this marketplace growing the way it has today? No, I think, um, you know, to your point, um, there definitely was a role to play from a proactive standpoint. To your point, um, in fairness, uh, we, uh, as an industry, found ourselves on our back foot when this happened. And you know, um, we've got some forums now where we can you know, deliver this differentiated message so people understand what it is. Um, so I think you know, that is gonna be absolutely key in um, you know, getting more people to uh, rally to uh, Phil's rallying cry, I think is gonna be important. Agreed. You know, Ram, in general, markets tend to be reactive, right? The stock market, every market tends to be reactive. But from your perspective, is there anything that the, the capital markets can do proactively, or is it always going to be a, a reactive Yeah, this is a response? difficult one, because the valid when made doctrine goes back to common law. It's been tested at the Supreme Court level. It's hard to bake in this type of risk factor. It's like waking up one day and saying, hey, you've got to drive on the left side of the road, not the right side of the road. It's not how we operate, how we govern and, and set up our contracts. So I don't know there's much you can do to anticipate this type of risk. I think the engagement from OLPI, MLA, and more engagement in public policy um, and, and having discourse and evidence-based analysis and encouraging the principles of, of transparency, I think, I think we're all in the right direction. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult one to, to, to address and from hindsight. Yeah, I agree. So I, if I, I'll just add uh, sort of in the hindsight part um, and it, it, I think, uh, Ram, you said, made a comment earlier that, that you were shocked, investors were shocked. Mm -hmm. um, you should never be shocked by a court decision, by the action of Congress, by the actions or inactions of state legislatures or anything. Assume you will lose. Just start with that assumption. Prepare your company for that. Prepare your investors for that. Guys, you can go home. You, you, no, no I, I, it, it's... I mean, I was involved in many, many suits against me and my office, and you know, I'd have lawyers telling me, don't worry, we're fine, we're not gonna lose. The good news is we, we really rarely ever lost, but I, I'd, I'd have to push back and say, no, what happens if we lose? I need to know, you know what happens, what do we do when we lose, how do we respond, and so, go into these things with eyes wide open 
and never be shocked by, uh, by the result. And uh, it, 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 trust me, it, it, it's, a, it, it will, it, it's not a comfortable feeling, but it, it will help uh, prepare you. Understood. So I'm gonna ask all our panelists to answer this question, and it's a little bit forward looking. But let's assume for a second that Phil's right and, and the name Madden becomes again synonymous with football. Three months, six months down the road. What happens next? I mean, we've all seen that aside from Madden, there have been other states that have sort of come into the fray and, and piggybacked on that case. Colorado, as, as one example, as mentioned earlier. What happens if the legislation that's being proposed now is successful? Does the market then just turn right back around and go back to how it was before Madden? What happens next, assuming that the Madden case becomes a non-issue in six months. Let's start with David and then go down the aisle. So, I think what uh, folks in the industry should be pushing for is a much more consistent approach at the federal level, uh, regardless of you know what happens um, with 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 the bills that are out there. You, you should be pushing for the federal regulators to, to have a much more consistent approach. Uh, and I would say do, do so at the, the level of the FFIEC because what you're stuck with now are you get guidance from the OCC, you get guidance from the FDIC, you get something different from the uh, National Credit Union Administration, you've got the CFPB. When you, when you tie this into the FFIEC, you get everybody on board for one consistent federal approach. And I think that, that, that there should be efforts to push the federal regulators in that direction, whether it's on you know, third party due diligence, relationships between banks and third parties. Um, all of this, uh, we would be much better off if there was a, a consistent federal approach. Agreed, so, so Alex, what happens the day after Madden goes away perhaps? I think it'll um, help alleviate some uncertainty, um, especially in the secondary market, but uh, I, I don't think it's going to, you know, I think we're still gonna have to be engaged. Um, there's this kind of conflation and separation of Madden and then true lender, and I think states are still gonna be focused on our industry and how the tension between federal regulation and state regulation over, over us. So um, there's still gonna be a lot of engagement, and um, you know, we've, we've been trying to just make sure that we're engaged on all levels to kind of prepare for all the different. So, so not to press, does that mean nothing changes the day after? I think, it, no, I think it does, I think it does. I think it will help, but. Um, okay, and, and Ram, you know, as you mentioned earlier, um, markets tend to be reactive. Mm -hmm. So from your view, I would think that would be deemed as positive news, but there still yeah. is the uncertainty from other states that are sort of piggyback off the case. So right. can you say with any certainty that the market will react positively, or you have your feeling as to whether things will sort of remain the same and be murky? How do you no, see I think that? we'll see. I think it'll be positive for investor confidence. I think you'll see resumption in lending in District 2. Here's a CEO of a lender that probably talk about that in a moment as well. You'll see uh, greater vibrancy, greater origination growth. Alex brings an excellent point around true lender, though. We do need resolution around true lender as well. If you resolve that and Matt at Midland, I think you have a solid regulatory foundation. There's a good analogy for this market. You have the credit card market. You have banks that originate, they export across state lines. They fund via the securitization markets. It's a competitive market. Um, and if we have regulatory uh, clarity, we can have a, a similar successful market here. One other comment I'll make is that I'm very positive on the regulatory outlook. If you look at the public statements from the Federal Reserve, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the OCC, the US Treasury, and the FDIC, They've all acknowledged the positive impacts from, of marketplace lending on financial inclusion, on lowering rates to borrowers. Really, the issues that are being discussed now have to do with jurisdiction and role. Is it a state regulator issue? Is it a federal issue? Um, and so the intellectual high ground has been won uh, in terms of the role of marketplace lending. That's a really important vantage point. Sure. So, Jeffrey, in your mind, what happens the day after? I think similar to uh, what other folks have touched on, you know, as you think about the different uh, uh, participants yeah, from a you know agency perspective, I think uh, David is absolutely right. Um, even if uh, it's overturned, there's got to be a effort made to kind of push regulators to clarify further. I think at the state level, even if it was overturned, 
you're going to still have states that are concerned about predatory lending. Right? So they're going to have that ongoing concern. And I think the, the challenge for industry is to deliver this differentiation uh, message and try and get you know, those states comfortable. And then from an investor standpoint, I agree. I think that you'll see more liquidity. But um, I think, uh, as I think Ram and others said, um, until we really hit this true lender uh, piece also, I don't think we fully resolve the problem space. Agreed. So uh, in, in summing it up before we take some questions, uncertainty is bad, collaboration is key, proactive education is really important. Any questions from the audi audience? Okay. Then, oh, so go ahead. Someone throw him the uh, box. Nice throw. <laughs> So from an expectation standpoint, can you give us a sense of if there's a positive repeal or this legislation that's currently in Congress gets through, how does that ripple through the industry? Does that, is there a follow-up? Is there another regulatory challenge? Or, or how does, what are the ripples of Madden after this? Is, this a new, is there a new battlefront? Or <laughs> just to get a sense of what expectations should be as Madden starts moving to its final innings. Who wants to take that? Ram, you're probably the... Well, I'd say, you know, from an investor confidence perspective, you'll have greater securitization, you'll have more origination in District 2, you should have lower interest rates in those markets. Um, you know, there are investors that are on the sidelines, even at the federal level, because they're concerned about some kind of contagion on Madden Midland. Um, I can't speak to the, the legal ramifications and the downstream effects of the state regulators. It's a, probably better served by someone else on the panel. Did I answer your question? Go ahead. Box over here. Come on, Khan, just throw from where you are. Uh, so uh, talk about Madden. Are there competing cases elsewhere? If so, how far along are they? If not, does the OP need to sponsor a case? In other words, you guys are waiting for legislation. I get it. Sometimes, in my experience, it takes a long time. You don't get what you, you expect. But there are no, I haven't heard anybody talk about any competing cases that are either at the federal circuits, somewhere else, or even in a district court. I knew we should have a law firm on the panel. No, I'm only kidding. Does someone want to take that? Alex, do you want to um, that? Well, that are, that are addressing this, issue, this yes. issue. I mean, you do have the, the Colorado um, AG action that is. It, I'm talking about a case that, uh, you know, what, case. What, if the circuits disagree, the sure. Supreme Court is much more likely to take the case. Um, I think there, uh, one of the reasons why the Supreme Court didn't take up the, the case was because there wasn't as big of a, a circuit split. Um, I'm not aware. Right. I, I can't speak off the top of my head. And so the question is whether OP or some other organization should, right. as in many other uh, pieces of lit litigation, whether you guys should get involved in pushing a case forward to resolve the question if your legislation doesn't come through. Uh, I'll defer to Khan on that. I don't know if Khan wants to answer that. The expert on that, but there, there is a related case in Colorado, which it's a state case, but it could, uh, be, because it uh, deals with federal law, it could percolate up to the federal level and you might get your conflict that way. Is that not right? Yeah, yeah, that's the Colorado AG. It was started yeah. by the, the AG case. Other questions? So I have a question, um, David. You know, you referred to um, you making a distinction between, you know, sort of payday, high-cost lenders versus those that are probably more like uh, in line with what Marlette's doing with Best Aid. But looking at the high-cost lenders, as a former regulator, what are some of the things that, that you think that a high-cost lender would do that, if you were still a regulator, you would find consistent with responsible lending practices? So I would say um, the, the payday lending industry could uh, uh, do a lot to improve its reputation if it could demonstrate that it was moving people out of long-term debt. Uh, the, the, the sort of the, the promise of payday lending is that it will, uh, it, it helps people in an emergency situation. They're, you know, you know, due to cash flow purposes, and if that is the case, then it should be, you know, 
that they could make a very quick case that you know you're either you know you're you're one and done and, and or you know you you have to pay it off and you can't come back or you know I think you know Colorado has done a, a good job at at uh, at trying to to change the the practices. Other states have have taken different approaches, um, turning this into an installment loan. Um, so, that, but but these these rollovers, you know, you know, after two weeks or four weeks or whatever it is, you know, where a, a three hundred dollar loan, you know, becomes a a, a nine hundred dollar loan when all of the, the fees start to, uh, to, 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 to roll up. Um, I think that the industry could, could make a, a legitimate case that, it, you know, that they are doing what they were intended to do, which, which was to meet those emergency needs. Um, I th but you know, quite frankly, a lot of states kind of roll their eyes when they, they hear this because they, they see the data that show uh, that, that, that this turns into a long-term debt trap. Okay, I think we're out of time, so I want to thank our panelists and the audience. Thank you very much. Great. Cheers. Good to see you, Jeff.